I was moved from county jail in October of 2016, following my conviction for armed robbery. I'm not here to garner sympathy, but I want to be clear on a couple of things. This was an unfair sentence. Not in the usual innocent man put in jail type of schlock, but in the way that they were clearly pushing me towards being put in a particular jail. I had my blood tested and my hair was sent to a lab. They took pictures of my fingernails. I had never seen anything like it, but I was basically catatonic. I was in a bad place. I wanted it all to just be over. At the time, I did not think much about the processing. I did not think about the records that were passed between the guards and doctors. And I did not care much about the blue rubber stamps that were put at the base of every signed legal document. I did not know what was normal and what wasn't. I just wanted to get into the haze and no brain the next six or so years away. I was put in a cell with Lian Soon, a Chinese-American man. To this day, I do not have the slightest idea what he was in for. The guy looked like your average college kid. But there was just something off about him. He just had this look of complete dissociation, like he was miles away. He never really looked at you. It was as if he looked straight through you. Then again, a lot of inmates get that. I barely managed to talk to him in the first few days. We agreed that I took the top bunk, but that was pretty much all we managed to talk about. We had a straightforward schedule. Breakfast and work up until eleven. Lunch. More work. Some yard time. Dinner. After that, we either got to our specialized programming time, religious services, Narcotics Anonymous, anger management, etc., or an extra hour in the yard, then back in the cell, lights out by eleven. In my first few days, I had to go through a lot of orientation. There were the kind of who's who introductions you might expect, but also just someone pointing to which shelf they stock the detergent. Basic stuff. I got a job cleaning the beddings. They were so cheap that a firm enough poke would go straight through them, like a piece of paper. Washing them was basically putting them in a shredder. We had to go on such a low setting that they rarely ever got clean. I swear I saw a cockroach in one of the pillowcases once, and the damn thing was still alive after the wash and dry. The pillows were also crap. They ripped easily, and feathers would get stuck to everything. There probably wasn't a room in this whole facility without feathers littering the floor. Hell, they were even in the yard. Most of them were, in fact. We would have rotating schedules, so I rarely got to work with the same people two days in a row. I started to recognize a few faces, but people mostly kept to themselves. There was no locker room talk, no braggarts, no bravado, just people hunkering down and shutting up. But even early on I noticed something was off. I think it all came down to the yard. People stayed away from the prison yard. No one used the exercise equipment. People just stuck to the walls or silently walked by the fences. There were no loud conversations, no sports, nothing. And as soon as that free hour was up, people were pushing to get back in. From day one, I got the impression that the yard was a bad place to be but no one was telling me why. What kind of prison has dust on the free weights? By the end of the first week, I had started to get into the routine. I was out cold by ten most nights. Hell, I had the bedding with the least holes in them. Might as well use that luxury. But there was that one night when I just could not sleep. I would lay down, and then all of a sudden I would be wide awake. There was this whistling wind that came down the hall and it just kept echoing in the back of my head. At first it was a wind, then a whistle, and with no other sound around. It kept growing in my head until it sounded like a goddamn fire truck siren. I would push my hands against my ears, cover my head in a pillow, but it did not do a thing. Finally I just started to mutter to myself, just to fill the air with some other noise. Please stop. I would whisper. Please stop. And the funny thing? It did. It stopped. The next day, 
I was exhausted. I kept nodding off. Breakfast. Lunch. Dinner. Pretty much any time I could sit down. The guards would push me awake. And the other inmates just sort of stared at me. Some of them actively avoided me. Like there was something wrong with me. When it was time for the yard, the guards took me aside and asked me to help clean the common area. No yard time for me. Gotta sweep some feathers. That night I went to bed as soon as I could. But the moment my head hit that pillow, I was wide awake again. And down through the hall, there was that howling wind. There was no way for me to sleep. The sound just kept growing, and all my tiredness was just gone. Whispering did not work anymore. I had to speak out loud. Around midnight I was still awake. I was just lying there, talking to myself, putting words to the random thoughts in the back of my head to keep my mind occupied, anything to drown out that awful droning noise outside. I could not let it grow further. It was like trying to stop a ship from sinking, one bucket of water at a time. I do not have the slightest idea how Leanne tolerated it, but he did not say a word. Things just got worse. I could not sleep that entire night, so when it was time to get up, I could barely stand. I fell asleep brushing my teeth, dropping my toothbrush in the sink. Dulce. I was so used to talking to myself by then that I would blurt out whatever came to mind. I was sleep-deprived, exhausted, and just confused, and people took notice. There was this one guy, Marlin, who was about as new as I was, a short, athletic guy who was just itching for a fight. I accidentally bumped into him in the lunch queue, and he went off on me. He pushed me out of the line, bashed me over the face with a tray, and just started wailing on me. The guards were taking their sweet time, so I just had to take it. But I could not. There was just something in me that wanted to hurt this guy. I grabbed his shirt and looked him in the eyes. You want to get whipped, Greeny? I said. You want us to whip you? I do not know where the words came from. It was just the first thing that came to mind, and the sleep deprivation just forced it out of my mouth like a hiccup. Well, what, what did you say? He stammered. I asked if the little greeny wanted a whipping. He backed off. His jaw went slack as he just stared at me, unblinking. Just as I had found words out of nowhere, he had lost them. His eyes teared up as he backed himself up against a wall. The prison guards came up to restrain us, and I could see all the fight had run out of him. See you at the orchard, Greeny, I added. Whip, whip. Marlin broke down. He screamed, tears running out of his eyes. He dropped to the floor, and the guards had to carry him out. I thought I would feel good after that, but the way everyone was staring at me made me feel like a museum exhibit. I had this sickeningly wide smile painted on my face, but it was not mine. None of this was me. I was losing control, and it scared the hell out of me. I was a puppet. That night, I did not even bother trying to sleep. I knew that as soon as I laid down to try, I would just be wide awake again. Instead, I tried sleeping on my feet or sitting on the floor. This time Leanne could not ignore me. He sat up on his bed looking at me, instead of through me. You on something? he asked. You itching? Nah, I said, shaking my head. Just broken. Something's not right. You phobic? Trouble with the walls? Maybe I... I do not know. Can't sleep. Looks like you sleep all the time, just not in here. Yeah, I sighed. Yeah, that's about right. They stamp you when you got here? You got any stamps? Some, yeah. Blue ones. Everyone gets blue ones. What shape? I do not know, I shrugged. Leanne took a long look at me. In those few dragging seconds I could hear the wind outside growing louder, and I winced. I groaned to drown out the noise, but it was barely working. I might have to scream to keep it together for another night. 
They got two stamps, he said. A hand and a sunflower. You sure you do not know which one you got? Which did you get? I asked. What do they mean? I got the hand, he said. Most of us did. He pointed at me as to make a point. Maladaptive. Private prisons, I chuckled. Bullshit, all of it. Leon leaned back in his bed and closed his eyes. Yeah, he sighed, sorting us into flowers and hands like a goddamn daycare. Probably got a woodchuck and dolphin stamp, too. Leanne was out like a light, but as expected I could not sleep. I paced back and forth, screamed into a pillow, and tried massaging my ears. The scratching noise sort of helped, but I still found myself restless. Finally, I got out of bed and pressed my head against the door. Maybe if I let the wind howl, it would take pity on me. Maybe it would get to a point where it would either kill me or stop. I did not care which, as long as something happened. But the strangest thing came to me. As I pressed my head against the door, the sound became clearer. The wind softened to a whistle and then a gentle hum. The more I tried to lean into it to listen, the more beautiful it became. Right there, leaning against the door, I had the best sleep of my entire life. The next morning, Leon pulled me up as the guards did their rounds. I had slept all through the night, and I felt amazing. But even then and there at my best, I could hear a little piercing sound. That wind, that whisper, was still in the back of my mind, even now during daytime. But all I had to do was lean into it, to listen, and a wave of calm would wash over me. It worried me how easy it was. You got through it? Leon asked. I'm getting there. I was not paying much attention during breakfast. I was zoned out, listening to what had turned into a melody. Something was speaking to me, but not through words, through emotions and sensation. So it was not a word that warned me about Marlin creeping up on me with a sharpened toothbrush. It was not the guards or the other inmates. No. It was something in the back of my mind screaming at me to hurt him. So I did. All I heard was laughter. There was this alien joy springing up in my chest, forcing me to my feet. I remember turning around and the world looking different. I felt four feet taller. I was looking into Marlin's eyes. But I did not see him. I saw a teenage kid running through an orchard hunted by his older brothers who wanted to beat him with a tire iron. Whip, whip! When I came to, I was still laughing. It was not my own laugh, and neither was the joy. The howling wind was finally quiet, but I felt like a stranger in my own body. I could not feel my limbs, and it took me seconds just to orient myself, to remember my fingers, my feet, my eyes. Marlin was bleeding on the floor from a dozen wounds. Deep bruising, broken bones. Possibly brain damage from repeated hits to the side of the head. Involuntary twitching, like a fish out of water, his mouth opening and closing. Hey, like me, he just could not find the words. It looked like I had beaten him with a goddamn tire iron. I was taken back to my cell without a word. Paraded through the halls like a prize. I could feel the other inmates staring at me, trying to figure me out. As soon as I looked their way, I saw them recoil. I do not know what the hell they had seen, but they were looking at me like a goddamn monster. I was locked in my cell for hours. No one was allowed in. And all the while, I kept hearing something in the back of my head, singing to me, asking me to listen just a little closer. And as soon as I resisted, that noise turned to pain. Within minutes, I was pacing the cell, spewing whatever nonsense came flooding through my mind. Nonsense about everything and everyone. Just noise. When the guards finally opened the door, I turned to them without skipping a beat. They had their tasers ready. Deb does not know if Eddie is really your son, I rambled. You think he was premature, but she had that time with Irvin at her job the month before. She thinks about telling you. She thinks that might just be the push you need to finally divorce. A taser to the neck. 
and I did not even feel it. As I dropped to the floor in a spasm, my body was screaming with laughter. He had her on the copier. She did not even think about you. She hoped to see him there again the next week. And there, somewhere deep inside, I found my own thoughts and words. Standing by as someone else held the reins, I wanted to tear my ears out, to make it all go away, but I could not even move my hands. I had listened too long, and too closely, and now the guards were dragging me by the neck. They took me out to the yard. I heard them talking. They were standing next to me, carrying me, but it still sounded like they were in another room. I could barely make out their voices. Hatchetman mixed up the bloodworks, they said. I got the wrong class. Shit, we got a bloomer. We had a bloomer this whole time. It is a goddamn Christmas miracle he did not pop his cellmate. So why are we taking him out? Just making sure protocol. Fuck protocol. Fuck off. They left me in the middle of the yard, lining up in a circle around me. The guard I'd been yelling at stayed inside, weeping over a picture. After a few minutes, I felt a tingle in my hands. It felt like being poured back into my body, like my mind was a liquid. It all came back to me, one thing at a time. Language, memories, senses, choice. Suddenly, I was standing up. The wind was clearer out in the open. It was colder than expected, and I was not even wearing my shoes. There was a stillness in the air, but there was something menacing to it, like the eye of a storm. Nothing is happening, I heard. We take him in? Hold on. Look up. From afar, it looked like snow. I did not even question it. Snow in mid-July? Sure, why not? But it was not snow. A white feather touched my nose. I looked up into the clouds, and there, far above, I saw something looking back. I cannot explain what I felt at that moment. It felt like I was looking into an eye in the sky, an impossible physical being, but there was nothing there. And yet, it spoke through me, like playing a mind game of charades with myself. Pictures flashing in the back of my mind, trying to reach an understanding, hundreds of memories pounding at the front of my brain every second, like a pitcher being filled up and spilling over the edge. I got a nosebleed trying to keep up. My eyes rolled back, but I still felt like I was looking up. It was easier to see with my eyes closed. My mouth seized up from trying to find a thousand words at once, instead settling on noises and grunts. There were parts that were crystal clear. It showed me memories I did not know I had. It showed me my eyes opening for the first time, little hands grabbing my mother's cardigan. Her big 1980s glasses making her eyes look like a cartoon. It showed me waking in my crib, reaching for the little toys dancing overhead. And I understood what it meant, that we were born with this instinctual drive to reach beyond our means, to stretch towards the sky, to grab and pull down the unknown to us, making it a part of ourselves, that the most basic instinct of my being was meant to be here, to do this, to reach up. No! I wheezed. All was silent. I looked down as I floated six feet off the ground. No! I groaned. Memories of long-lost dreams came rushing back. Pleasant thoughts you do not want to wake from. Promise of love, lust, joy and comfort. It was all there, just waiting for me to take it. All I had to do was reach for it, to reach into the sky and take it. But there was something more, that eye in the sky looking down at me, not malevolent, not angry, not evil, just vast beyond comprehension. I was nothing more than a strand of wheat being plucked into the air by a curious farmer. No, 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 I screamed. They came running up to me. Guards grabbed my legs, pulling me down. It felt like I was being torn in half. 
part of me desperately reaching upwards and my conscious self holding me to the ground. All the while, the pleasant silence was turning from a whisper to a scream. We got it, a guard yelled as the weather picked up. Get him out of here. Something let go of me. The guard on my left lost his breath as he suddenly went limp. With nothing but a whistle, I saw him whisked into the sky. Not a word of protest, not a sound, just a human life growing smaller and disappearing overhead. I dropped to the ground as they scrambled to get inside. Another guard fell flat on his stomach as something invisible grabbed his ankles. Again, a soft whistle and he was gone, a spot in the dark. Run! Come on! The other guards were standing by the entrance, holding the doors open. They were waving at me, desperate for me to just run. But every part of me wanted to stay, to reach up, to touch the sky and go back to that place I was meant to be, to feel my mother's cardigan between my baby-soft fingertips and to look into the night sky with wonder of what could be. It was all there. And yet, my body knew to run. The moment I got inside, I heard thumping. Chunks of meat sprayed across the yard, fragments of bone getting stuck in the barbed wire. Fabric torn into shreds. Whatever was up there was happy now, and the howling wind was silent. We all just stood there. I could barely breathe. I'd been so close to surrendering, to give in to it. Whatever was up there had no intention of caring for me. There was no love, no joy, no comfort. All it could promise me was a swift death at best, or the life of a sleepless puppet. But for a moment we all just stood there. We were not inmate and prison guards. In that moment we were just people, trying to understand ourselves. I got processed the next day. They double-checked my blood. Turns out they had contaminated my result. Sloppy work from the esteemed people at Hatchet Biotechnica. This time, I saw them clearly stamp my papers. Blue ink in the shape of a little sunflower. I was taken out of state. They said it was a matter of security, on account of getting in fights with Marlin. Apparently he had broken both legs and his shoulder. Still, I knew better. This was not a matter of security, this was about fixing a grave mistake. This prison had a purpose, but I was not part of it. Instead, I did my time in a place with no wind, and now I am out on parole. To this day, I get a shiver up my spine when I hear the whistling wind. I am scared of my dreams, of my memories. I am afraid there is still something in me that wants me to go back to look up. My psychiatrist, Dr. Bogan, tells me I have an agoraphobic trauma to deal with. She says she has some kind of experimental treatment for it, but I do not know. Overexposure therapy sounds dangerous. But even now, I find myself suddenly waking in the middle of the night, my body talking to itself, telling truths I could not possibly know to an empty room. Sometimes not even in my own language. Sometimes in no language at all. Every now and then, a white feather still lands on my shoulder, and I just know that looking up will be the end of me, or the start.